hey, before this episode, check out Tokyo Dreams. It's our behind-the-scenes five-part vlog series on the Spartan combat wrestlers. We spent nine days embedded with Kyle Dake, Yanni D, Vito, and Gabe Dean during their final week before the Olympic trials. It's called Tokyo Dreams. Watch it now on YouTube. Going into that match, you know, I knew that um, I needed to stop him. He was strong. He was powerful. And I think my focus early on was make this big, strong guy react. You know, make him feel your pressure. Make him feel the threat to his legs. Make him... Um, Put, put some fear in him, like, I can't grab this guy. I can't get a hold of him. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100% how to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Welcome to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast, ladies and gentlemen. This is Ryan Warner, your host. My guest today is actually a guest from September. This is our second interview with the great John Smith. As you remember from the Smith audio documentary, we recorded three interviews with John. This is the second one. It was recorded in September of 2020. What else can we say? The great John Smith sharing his wisdom. I hope you enjoy it. Fan of the week goes to my man Izzy Silva, formerly the assistant coach at Fresno State, now doing incredible things at California USA Wrestling. Izzy, thank you for the support, my friend. We appreciate it. As always, Wrestling Changed My Life is proudly presented by Spartan Combat. Go to SpartanCombat.com to register for their spring national tournament taking place this May in Jacksonville, Florida. And that's it, folks. Let's give it up for the GOAT, John W. Smith. Cool. Ready to go? Ready. Cool. Let's start with 1988 Olympic Village experience. Take us into the Olympic Village. What are your memories of that? In? Well, when, when you just said that, the first thing that comes to mind was there was the three athletes from Oklahoma State that was, that was there. Uh, uh, one being, obviously, myself and Kenny Monday, but also Robin Ventura, um, baseball player. And so um, – that's what really kind of made the village nice is that we all were right there pretty close to each other and um, and uh, it was really a, a, a neat experience just kind of um, and you're talking more 88 right 88. yeah 88 yeah um, it's just a neat experience from the standpoint of um, what you hope for right I mean you're just you, you, you make an Olympic team and you're still like four or five, maybe six months out before we, we actually go to the Olympics. And <clears throat> you've heard about these villages over and over again and the experience of them. So um, in 88, you know, was probably, um, you know, took my experience and it took it even higher of what my expectations was going to be. The village, you know, the food, the people, all the excitement, uh, more so than ever in Barcelona, you know that that village in um, Seoul, Korea was just unbelievable, and the experience was uh, uh, a lot of fun. Why do you think it was different from Barcelona? Oh, I think just my environment, you know, coming on, where I was at that time in my career, you know, there's really no choices here. You know, it's likely the end. Um, you know, I didn't give myself the the, the probably the. Uh, 
the treat of enjoying anything, you know, because I struggled that summer, you yeah. know, and and so my concern that whole time was, I've got to win, I, you know, I've got to end up on top, you know. So uh, from the, you know, I'm, I don't know if it was any different in '88, but you know, there's, you you know, you've got a, still uh, uh, some career left in you, even regardless of what happens at this championship. I'm I'm going to be wrestling for several more years. Yeah, and we'll talk about it at the end, kind of juggling the coaching and the wrestling in 91, 92, because that was a crazy year. Day one of your Olympic experience, you start, you know, wrestling starts two weeks in, so you're probably getting a little stir crazy. Had you gone to a lot of other events? No, not too many. Um, you know, I don't, I don't remember going. I remember following them. You know, it was kind of neat. They had a newspaper there, and, and each day, um, you know, you got to read about other athletes. Uh, um, but I don't, I don't remember going to any events outside of just the opening ceremonies and then going ta- downtown a few times and, and just being in the, uh, you know, around the, the Olympic uh, uh, people that had come to watch the event, um, you know, just kind of experiencing a little bit, not too much. I just remember you just didn't want to stay in the dorms all the time, so you did get out, mm-hmm. you know, and I think when we got out, it wasn't necessarily to advance, it was to walk around down in, Ite one or places like uh, that down in the shopping area, just kind of visiting and maybe pick up a few s- souvenirs. Just so, some extra time to, to you know, uh, between practices, you know, yeah. rather than laying around all the time. So you were there for a mission, obviously. Yeah. Day one, so you wrestled Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Tuesday is one of the, just the longest days I read about for you. It starts in the morning, you beat the Hungarian, um, start with a nice slide by or a, a drag by, and you really open it up there. But then that night, you had the Bulgarian who broke your nose, I believe. Mm-hmm. What do you remember from that match? I remember um, getting really dizzy in that match. And I got real nervous because just a you know, the way they look at somebody that seemed to got rock a little bit, you know. Um, so I just kind of really focused on playing it off a little bit. But I did get dizzy in that match. Mm. Um, what I remember about the match, it was my toughest match in the Olympics, I think. Yeah, even though I went on to win, uh, I don't know what the exact score was, but uh, it was uh, th- three or four points. Um, Steriff was... Um, as good as anyone I ever wrestled at that at that point in time in my career, mm. um, and I was and I was uh, well aware of that going into the match that this this match is one of those guys that you're going to have to beat, you know. And I was right; he ended up third, you know. Um, but by far, for me, I think it was the toughest match I had in the Olympics. And how did it was the in nose, day one? How did the nose break happen? What was the scenario? Just, you know, I, I don't know what happened really. It just kind of, it just, I just remember maybe catching a knee and 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 not really feeling it, and um, uh, I was more concerned with just being dizzy. You know, just like, um, you know, don't show any emotion here because you know dizzy's not good, mm-hmm. even back then. You know, um, I don't think concussions were looked at, you know, like they are today, but. Uh, uh, I was a little concerned and just kind of wrestled through it. And and really, um, it bothered me a little bit uh, throughout the um, tournament. Um, but the only, I mean, really the only thing that bothered me was it's painful at times. But outside that, I could breathe fine, you know. I was, I was doing fine. So um, it was just a, you know. Um, I think if I had to work out and practice every day with a broken nose, it would have been a lot tougher scenario. But being in the Olympics and you know you only got a few matches here, uh, get over it, right? <laughs> it's, you know, it's not going to interfere with what we're trying to do here. But, but no question in practice, it would probably have been a, something to have that, that been tough to deal with. Sterev was a guy who, he had a battle with Randy in 82. Mm-hmm. That was like a 14-pointer. Randy actually beat him on the scoreboard. And then later that night, they came back for the finals. This is in Canada, the 82 Worlds. And the referees had overturned the match, and Steriff technically won. And then he went on to win in 82, I think. One, yeah. Yeah, he was tough. He was good. And he was, um, he had been wrestling 149 and a half pounds, you know. Um, 
you know, for 69 kilos uh, for the last several years. Um, you know, watching watching his progression from 82 to probably 88, um, pretty impressive. Got a lot better, you know, and um, just knew going into that tournament, you know, that that likely I was going to have to go through him. I prepared that I was going to have to go through him to win a uh, to win the gold medal, um, and I was right. You know, like I said, you know, um, he was that good. He was really. Uh, at 62 kilos, melting down, wrestling 100, 149 and a half pounds uh, all those years and melting down um, really uh, gave him a level of strength and power at this weight where he was a guy that could could have been one of the hopefuls to win. And so Sarkissian cut down too. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so both Olympics, you, you beat the guys who finished second and third. Right. <laughs> you know, 92... Uh, obviously, the, the Iranian, then Reynoso, but this year, too, you know, uh, in 88, the Bulgarian. Yeah. So that night, I read an article that that night you had to hitchhike a ride home because you had the weight wasn't coming off and you were like the last one to make weight. What happened that night afterwards? Just struggled a little bit with my weight, you know. I don't know if the weigh-in was... I can't remember if it was that night or that morning, but I just knew I needed to... I think it was that night, and I was one of the last ones to, to make weight, and um, everybody had left. And, um, yeah, I hitched hike home, got a ride with some, with the Korean national team. Um, and I don't know where they were going, but for some reason it had, they had to go out of the way to take me back to the village. So, um, you know, it was, uh, late night and everybody left. All the coaches were gone and, and I thought somebody was going to hang out with me, but maybe I didn't, I I don't think I told them I was going to be working out. I just felt like, you know, I felt a little bit heavy and um, and not that I really struggled ever making weight. Um, uh, I was just a little bit heavier than normal, you know, and and it took a little longer than I thought, you know, and all of a sudden I'm looking around and I'm the only guy around. Uh, everybody's gone. I'm thinking, now, how am I getting back? I know I walked outside of the Korean coaches and, and I think it was the Greco team maybe. I don't know if they Greco wrestled before or after, but um, somehow they noticed me, and I, you know, asked them for a ride to the village. And anyway, I got back. We'll call Coach Humphrey and be like, Coach, you yeah. left one year. Well, yeah, I don't. I don't think he did anything wrong. I, <laughs> I don't think I told anybody. You know. Yeah. Because they, they they darn sure would have been around if, if I was if they knew I was training. In the in that same article where it says you hitchhiked back, it said you got back to the village about 11 p.m. and then you watched film that night. And I was kind of wondering, what were you looking for that close to a competition when you're watching film? Oh, I think maybe um, you know, just maybe just a refresher on the competition I had coming up. You know, and I thought I did that very often. I mean, um, you know, if I said that in '88, I'm, I'm sure that's what happened. But that would be unusual for me. Right. To, to watch film the night before, but if I did, it was just to reassure me of the things that I know I needed to attack, maybe against Sarkissian. Um, maybe I was watching somebody in day two. Uh, um, I don't, I don't ne- necessarily remember the competition, but maybe I was watching someone that maybe I was going to wrestle I hadn't seen yet mm-hmm. or never focused on. Right. So. Okay. But it wouldn't have been anything too important. I know that I never, I never really focused on going back and watching my opponents that I had next. Um, I was pretty good about all through my career. I was really good about watching that my opponents like four months before competition, the big competitions, and then it was just like I had a pretty good memory. Uh, exactly what I need to do with them. And I never had to go back and review film from that point forward. Hmm. I had a pretty good idea of, you know, those top guys, you know, where I needed to attack, looking at their style and going, they can't handle me, you know, and, and or looking at their style and going, you're going to have to put way more energy in this match with moving your feet than, than, Sarkissian or than someone else, you know. Um, and so uh, I think, 
you know, I, I, that was a real blessing for me to be able to, you know, kind of print that in my head and not have to go back to it. So that's why I, that sounds a little bit different. It must have been a pony that I was concerned about that I hadn't seen. Sure. And, and that's why I was asking because it didn't seem like something you would do. So then Wednesday you beat the Mongolian. Thursday it's Sarkissian, and it's kind of like the showdown, right? He won the Europeans that year, and you know, the Soviet Union was loaded at that time mm -hmm. with all the guys that you had knocked off, you know, Alexiev, um, and so on and so forth. Rumor has it is that Leroy had written you letters, kind of getting you ready for Sarkissian. And again, I don't know if that's just something a reporter wrote or if that's true. I was just curious what you remember. Leroy always wrote things. You know, he always gave me a, a list of things to do, you know, always. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say that uh, absolutely. I, I'm sure that uh, he was actually, I think he was still in Switzerland at the time. I don't think he made it to the Olympics, but I think he sent me some messages on several occasions of, you know, he was more focused on, you know, what I did, you know, than so much, here's how you're going to beat so-and-so, you know. It's more that, to remind me of what I did well and that, I can take what I do to the mat and beat anyone in the world. And so just kind of reminding me of those, uh, my, my talents and my abilities, you know, and, and, and helping me build confidence in it, that, that I can execute and I will execute, you know. So I think that Leroy was more of those kind of messages, you know, not here's how you're going to beat Sarkissian. Right. Um, here's how you're going to beat Sarkissian. It's going to be you and what you do, you know, that kind of message. Got it. Mm -hmm. And then that night it happens, you win your first gold medal, you know, your pops is there, you, you throw the hat in the crowd. There's a number of sequences we could talk about, but there's one in particular where it looks like you broke his will. And he was in deep, you scrambled, and then there's another situation where you hit a low single, he scrambled out, you got back again. I mean, what sequences jump out to you as make or break moments in that mm -hmm. match? Well, I think... Shutting him down um, early on was going to be a key. You know, guy that as powerful as he is, um, and he was strong. Um, but as powerful as he was, you know, and shutting him down, um, you know, part of my strategy, I think, mentally was that I wanted to keep him moving. I wanted to keep him reacting. Um, and I always, you know, I've used this strategy in, uh, on many occasions, you know, is don't worry about scoring. If, the, if scoring happens, it's going to happen out of your instinct. You know, you're just, you're going to feel something because, you know, you're moving and, and uh, the opportunity is going to be there, you know. But I really focused on, um, yeah. I was going in the right place with that. You ready to go again? Yeah. So where did we say? Just that you were in that moment, match with Sarkissian, you were Yeah, so, your feet. so going into that match, you know, I knew that um, I needed to stop him. He was strong, he was powerful, and I think my focus early on was make this big, strong guy react. You know, make him feel your pressure. Make him feel the threat to his legs make him um, put, put some fear in him, like, I can't grab this guy. I can't get a hold of him, you know. Um, and, and don't worry about scoring. And I've used this tactic, you know, many, many times, you know, um, with certain people, you know. And if I scored, it just was a reaction. Boom, I'm in on a low single leg, you know. I'm not even thinking, you know. I'm thinking about my strategy. I let my body and, and the reaction take over with points. And so um, I did a good job of that. Yeah. A lot of frustration, you know. And, and I think when I put my fourth point up um, late, in the, late in the match, um, with, with time remaining, you know, um, it broke him. You know, I, I think the one time he got on top and, <clears throat> uh, and he couldn't turn me, that, that gave a lot of fear to him, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I don't know when his point came. I don't remember, but I, all I can remember is I, I had more limber in my arms than I felt like I ever had in my life, and all of a sudden I'm just like, you know, wiry, you know. 
he's picking up an arm and he's so strong, you know. I just kind of limp and I'm kind of rolling my arms and it's just like, I can't, I, I watch that match every now and then and I'm like, uh, I didn't know it was that flexible. I've never seen that kind of flexibility. It was almost like um, there was a level of flexibility I had that night that I didn't realize, you know. So I just, a lot of instinct, but um, it was a tough match and because it forced me to, to move the whole match and forced me to um, stick pretty close to my strategies of taking him out. Man, awesome. And yeah. so podium stand that night, you know, when I've talked to other people about standing the Olympic podium, sometimes they have no memories, sometimes they have a lot of memories. If you had any, do you remember what they wore that night? Oh. Were you thinking about that train ride in the Soviet yeah, Union? Yeah, you know, I just had, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, the, one of the proud moments is, you know, you're from Oklahoma State, right? And you have a, a great history of, of um, Olympians, you know, and I get to add my name to that, you know. So, um, you know, some people might assume that, you know, doing things on your own and doing it uh, by yourself um, um, is the ultimate. To me, just being a part of a legacy, uh, uh, being a part of a lot of people that, you know, that had motivated me in, and I never met them, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, I mean, that's the first thing that came to my mind, you know. I think probably more so than any, it was just uh, a proud moment that we have another Olympic champion from USA, but, but also Oklahoma State, right? So right. it's a good feeling and... Um, you know, I don't know, like you said, I don't know if you think of any more than that. Um, I know my dad was there, and that was that was special. I remember making eye contact with him, and, um, um, you know, and there's nothing like when you see that flag for the first time, you know. I talk about it all the time, that your first, your first experiences are the best, you know. I mean, winning my first world championship was, you know, the, the greatest experience in my life, you know. Winning my first Olympic championship was even a better experience in my life. You know, um, I think in 92, winning the gold medal, I, I wasn't nearly as excited. There's more of a sense of relief, but not the excitement like a young kid doing something that he had great passion for and he lived for this moment. And so um, there's a lot of things that go through your mind, but I can tell you this, it's all exciting. I mean, it's it's an unbelievable experience in just accomplishing, you know, the ultimate in your sport, and then and then being able to share it with so many people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's cool too. Beautiful. Yeah. And then so you you win in '89 again. You beat Sergey in one of my favorite matches. But then the rivalry that I really love is Reynoso because you wrestled him in February of '90, and then at the Grands in December of '90. So that's a perfect bookend of 90s season. Um, and 90s really the last year where you had peace to train because then all the crazy stuff happened with C and, and we'll talk about that. But before you go down to Cuba, you, you've said in other interviews that the endorsements are coming in. Maybe you're living a little undisciplined, which mm -hmm. is hard to believe. But do you think money kind of corrupted your training and your mindset and your edge before that match? Um. No, I think, you know, probably. I mean, yeah, it did, you know. I mean, I think you grow up in a family of 10 and, you know, you, you, you're not living, you're not, you're not getting anything extra, that's for sure, you know. Um, yeah, I think, I think the opportunity of um, winning and, and having some success, all of a sudden you got, you got more money than you've had, for sure. Um, yeah. You know, there was no question, but it wasn't like lavish or something, you know. It was just like, you know, just not living out your routine that that got you there. And it wasn't that, you know, it was that I was partying more or something like that. It was just uh, a little bit more comfortable, you know, just with with things. And wrestling's not comfortable, mm -hmm. you know. And, and my style is, is very hard. And it's not comfortable. If I'm going to wrestle the way I want, I need to wrestle to win. Mm -hmm. It's harder than than what most people do. 
you know, mm -hmm. it's not easier, you know, so, um, and then all of a sudden when you don't have, your, you don't have the matches and you're not wrestling the way you should be wrestling, um, something you sacrificed along the ways and probably me, money made a difference, you know, in, in my poor effort in, in February of 90. Um, I was disappointed, but also I wrestled a guy that I did not, again, I didn't give a lot of respect to. And we found out he was, gave me a, a hard time every time we wrestled, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I viewed it like there was something wrong with me, which was the way I needed to view it. Um, but to come out, you know, um, you know, later on, you know, recognizing he, you know, he won another match against me, right? So kind of reminded me that, um, you know, wasn't all my lifestyle at that time. It was that he's that good, and he's and you got a conflict of, of style with a conflicted style with this guy, and it's it's tough on you. Yeah, you know, even when I separated the points later on that year, it was a tough match, you know. Um, but it was a good. It was just it was good the way I viewed that loss in February in Cuba. We wrestled in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, it was just good the way I viewed it, you know, because it really was the start for me um, talking a little bit like Sanchez, you know, first match back from from winning your first world championship to here I am my first match back to first tournament back from winning the Olympic championships and I get beat. And the way I viewed it and I just, I viewed it the way I needed to view it, not pushing and blaming anything, putting everything back on my shoulders and, and not asking why, but know why, you know. Um, and I was able to answer that why. Like, you know, why did this happen? You know, well, I know why it happened. And, and I, I went back to my lifestyle and what I was doing in it. And, and that's what I needed to do. And I changed. I made it, and it made a difference in um, my r remaining career. That was the, the kind of the pivotal point that... Um, that got me through some some of some of the, of the uh, other struggles that um, come a little bit later towards the end of my career. Well, and then you also, along with this, you had done an interview where you said it was like right. It was like the winter of '89, and like '92 seems like an eternity away, mm -hmm. right? And you had said it's a daily struggle for me to stay motivated right now. Like right now, mm -hmm. I can't even see '92. It seems so far away. Like you were kind of going through that. I don't know if it was a post Olympic blues or just saying, hey. You've already reached the pinnacle. How do you stay motivated for the next four years? So is that something you battled with? Well, I think the struggles maybe I had, and that's it, it makes sense that I said that um, for me anyway. Um, well, I think you know um, nothing gets easier. You know, um, I don't know when that comment was made, whether it was after the World Championships or before the World Championships, but it was either a two or a three time. Uh, world champion, including the Olympics, but um, as one of them, um, nothing gets easier, you know. And and so, you know, we we've seen in in our sport, we've seen in other sports, just repeating is just like a beast, you know. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of it is just that, uh, you know, most people aren't after you win. Most people aren't going to settle for something less, or you hopefully they don't, you know, but history has told us in sport, regardless of what sport it is, you just don't repeat, you know, mm -hmm. it's hard to repeat. And so I think a lot of that was on my mind, probably in 89 and just like, um, yeah, I can't, I can't look past 89 guys. I got to work my butt off to win a world championship. You know, I can't look beyond this year. Mm -hmm. I, I need to focus on this year. I'm not sure I'm, you know, uh, you know, I'm not sure that I can maintain my level without uh, focusing too far down the road. I need to focus just on one thing at a time. And that might mean just making the team, right? Because right. making the team has been, was tough yeah. on all my years, you know, um, maybe, maybe one of them, you know, uh, maybe one of them was, not so tough, but I can't remember, you know, so 
Um, I will say this, there was always for me a, such a relief of making a team that the world championships or the Olympics seemed easier to me. Hmm. You know, I think always battling your, your respected opponents within the, your U.S. was always seemed to be tougher. But anyway, sure in 89 that, that comment came from just, you know, slow down, you know. Um, I need to concentrate on just making the team, you know and winning. I mean, there's enough pressure on me that I'm supposed to be doing this, so let me do it. Did you have any doubts he'd wrestle in 92? No, I never did think about it. You know, I, I, I really took it one year at a time because I knew um, I enjoyed wrestling. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed it. Um, but there's just a, there's a tendency, just in general, that pe people put you in a place that you're really not when you start winning things. You know, and I was being put into place like, you know, the possible next greatest wrestler. And you know, these things are being said that you know I didn't feel like I, I was that person. And I can't go there with you. I got to stay right here in my little place, and I'm going to work my butt off to make the world team, and then I'm going to work again to try to win another world championship. And, when, and it's that simple. I'm not going any further than that. Mm. And at the end of that world championship, if I'm satisfied and I feel like I've fulfilled my career, I'll stop. You know? But, uh, there, and there was, there was a couple times that it was like, do you want to do it again? I questioned it. A month later, I realized, yeah, I'm doing this again. This is what I do, you know? So, um, for me, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was so important for me to just really just focus on what's at hand. Let's focus on, you know, one event at a time, especially after winning the Olympics. One event at a time and don't move where they want you to move. You know, don't talk, you know, be careful about your choice of words, respect your opponents because, um, you know, it just never came easy to me. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to convey with this story is that people my age here, John Smith, six-time world champ, they're like, oh, he steamrolled it, you know? Yeah. But what I'm trying to show is that every year it was oh, a man. freaking battle. Oh. And in that tournament in Cuba, you had walked outside and you had said, I'm done. Yeah. Is that true? Oh, yeah. Why? Oh, I was just fed up. You know, I was just fed up with the idea. And it goes back to saying, you know, um, Maybe I didn't respect him enough, but it wasn't really that. I think that um, I kind of let my guard down, like I said, after the Olympics a little bit. Um, really frustrated with that, that I didn't, I wasn't prepared in my first tournament coming back after the Olympics like I wanted to be. Um, I took off running, that's all I can remember. And I remember running in some neighborhoods and um, people just looking at me, you know, I just could kind of remember running. They were like, who is this guy, you know? <laughs> in your singlet? In my singlet, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I just, just, I can remember, it was one of those outdoor pavilions that had a, had a roof over it, but of course in Cuba, you know, I don't think there's anything indoors. Um, and I just remember, you know, running right out and running, I don't know, three, four, five miles. Trying to, you know, what, you know, what just happened and um, it's a good experience, you know. It's probably uh, what allowed me to come back and, of course, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm done with this. This is, you know, what, what do you hear? You're not even motivated. You didn't even want to be here. I didn't want to go either, by the way, and, and um, I was told to go, basically. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I threw my, you know, tantrum and um, on, the, on the flight back from Cuba, you know, I was able to refocus and regain an attitude that, listen, just, you know, write it up to what you're thinking, you know, you know why. Mm -hmm. Don't ask why, you know why, you know. And I was able to, I was able to do that my whole career, you know, with those experiences. You know, I, you could always, you could always, uh, I could always walk off the mat and just know exactly uh, why I didn't perform or 
why I f felt like the best in the world, mm. you know, and um, not give me a fa false sense of uh, confidence, you know, or, you know, trying to trick yourself into thinking you're something that you're not. Mm. And so that, that's the beauty of sport because here you are wearing your own shoes at this tournament and then Reynoso is like a homeless person almost, probably wearing $10 shoes and yeah. like sport just evens it out. You know, they don't yeah, care about they don't care. the fact that you have John Smith brute shoes, no. you know. And so when you refocus yourself, you enter what I call kind of this like, I call it selfish world because that's when you were just, not selfish in a bad way, but you had just gotten back to the basics. You set yeah. yourself a budget. And one of the things that it stood out to me was that you're thinking, all right, I've been in Tashkent. I know how those guys live. I got to at least live on a thousand bucks a month. Like that's, that's the best I can do to create an edge for me. So what, what did your world look like then once you created that budget? Did it shrink or? Yeah, it shrunk. It gives you, it limits your time, right? I mean, there's a lot of things you don't get to do when you're, you know, paying for a car, paying insurance now and <clears throat> living in an apartment and you eat, you need to eat good and healthy. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's expensive eating good and healthy, you know. A thousand dollars a month in, in 89, 90 is a lot of money, you know. Um, and it was enough, right? But uh, it doesn't allow you to just run off and go do things that that you that maybe I was doing a little bit of, mm -hmm. you know, fly fishing, certain spots in the world, and doing some things, you know, that kept me grounded and um, and you know, it just you know, it kind of just kind of refocused me in on just the things that that I really love, and that's winning. You know, that's wrestling and winning. You know, um, you can't buy anything, you know, no matter what kind of money you make. You can't buy anything. You can't buy uh, uh, medals, you know. You can't buy uh, that, that great feeling of training and, and feeling, feeling the, um, the excitement of I'm getting better and I'm developing, which happened at that time for me. Mm -hmm. You can't buy that. No money's going to buy it. And so... Let's let's slow down. And I, I say a thousand dollars. I probably spend a lot less, probably less than that. You know, I just just made a commitment to you know that let's get back to what what really was made you happy, and that's consistent day to day activity that um, helps you build, build your mind and continue to develop. Because getting better, there's nothing better than getting. I mean, feel, the feel of getting better. There's nothing, nothing that in my career that I, it really equaled to it. You know, that was the best. You know, that's what just r rises you up to a whole nother level is when you feel yourself getting better, whether, whether it be in, as a little leaguer, whether it be somebody that's trying to, you know, win their third or fourth world championship. Um, there's nothing better. And, and that's what kind of happened after that, that time in Cuba and, and through that year as we were trying to win, as I was trying to win my third one or maybe even after my third one. For sure. Now that's, it just shows like you can't buy the feeling of being alive. No. You know, no matter what. Now, you win the Worlds in 90 in Tokyo, and I heard that you went to Cancun afterwards, and it was the worst vacation of your life. Mm -hmm. I got the uh, LA Times article here. Yeah. What, I mean, I don't have to, but it was just like, Yeah, I went to Cancun, and all I could think about was just seemed like, what are you doing? You know, I mean, this is one week after, and you're going to, you, you know, I just couldn't even reward myself. It was like I got there, and I couldn't even, I was like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Why are you here? You know, and I start, you know, running sprints along the sand and look trying to get somebody to wrestle some some of these some of these people that were there trying to get them to wrestle in the water with me and some people I had met and let's come on I'll teach you how to wrestle Greco you know let's get in the and you know they were like are you crazy what are you talking about you know? oh my God. Uh, anyway it was just kind of sad that I couldn't enjoy a week off you know um uh but there was a level of motivation for me too, you know, that just kind of recognized that I, I don't need to be, that this is not what you're supposed to do. Mm. 
you don't have to do this after you win. You know, you should go home and just, you know, really what you'd rather be doing is maybe, you know, throwing a line in a few ponds and catching some largemouth bass. And let's, let's use it, you know, you just feel like, oh, I got to go do something, right? You know, I won again. It's time to go. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't need a vacation. So I think that's why I ask myself, why? Yeah. What am I doing here? You right. know, I'm like, is this what I'm supposed to do? You know, and, and I realize, no. No, you need to be, you should have went home and you should be at home and you should be doing things like the, the simple things you enjoy doing that, that gives you a lot of satisfaction. And so that was Cancun. That was my story on Cancun was, what am I doing here? Mm. What, why did you come here? You don't need to be here. Yeah. You know, and it was terrible. I didn't allow myself to have any success. And, and it wasn't because I didn't so much that I felt like I needed to be training as it was. I'm just doing things that people say I should do. Go, go take a trip. Take some time off. Well, I don't really want to do that, right? <laughs> so I like fishing at home. Yeah, you know, I like I mean, Oklahoma. I, and, and, you know, I, I can work out for 30 minutes, which I love to do after a tournament. Work out for 30 minutes a day for the next three weeks, hmm. you know. And go in, do stance in motion for 15, maybe drill 15, and I'm done. And not do anything else hmm. for three weeks, you know. Um, and rather than, I, I never really took completely time off. I just, I mean, I never did it. I didn't have to. I didn't need to. Mm -hmm. It was okay to go in and work out 30 minutes. And so there was no workouts in Cancun, you know, and it was like, what are you doing here? You know, so. That um, voice perks up, you know, like yeah. if, even like this, like if I'm, if I'm out having a beer versus prepping for this, it's like. That you know that's not the right thing to do. Yeah. Your body always knows what's the right thing. Yeah. You know? And then also, part of me, as I'm reading this, says, well, maybe Cancun wasn't fun because even though you won the world, you had an avenge a loss to Reynoso. And then, mm -hmm. but thank God, because of the wrestling gods, that December in Pittsburgh, you and Reynoso show down again with money on the line. And I can tell when you're trying to inflict some pain because you'll rip that bar out and really, like, I can tell when a loss is personal just from studying you so much. Um, so here's the, there's a little 30 second clip of you on top of Reynoso there. Oh, he's got it up over the back. It's a dangerous position. John Smith can score here. So he's very good for you. He likes this arm bar. Oh, had the full Nelson. Had the full Nelson for a second, but not long enough. There's two points. Nice cut wrench by John. Back in the way. He's got the cross ankle again. He needs to stand all the way up with it. That was. Yeah. It was it personal? Oh yeah. Absolutely. You know, in one of those events in December, you know, we had several of them back then, you know, mm -hmm. kind of cool events, you know, um, that brought maybe people together that you might not, might, might only get to see once a year, you know. Um, yeah, that was personal. Yeah. And um, I was ready. He wasn't. Yeah. Rich I didn't know that at the time. Oh. It's, you know, but um, uh, I was definitely ready he wasn't, you know. And so very seldom in December was I was I at a pretty good level outside of wrestling um, Sarkissian. Or not Sarkissian, but Bella Glazov, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Reynoso. Very seldom was I ready in December, and, and but... On those two events, you know, I, I forced myself to start my process a lot earlier, you know, just because um, they were big events and you wanted to be in them, right? Mm -hmm. The money, I mean, I don't know if it was even that much, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. But mm -hmm. um, it's more the big event. This is an opportunity to, to improve yourself. This is an opportunity to put yourself under stress and, 
and rise to occasion, you know, so that's how I looked at them. Love it. Yeah. And I need you to settle this because I keep getting conflicting responses. When you had a loss, did it eat you up and like burn you? Or was it something like, mm, I, I know I lost, I know what I need to do, I gotta get better. Because I was with Alan Free last week and he's, he's insistent that losses didn't bother you guys as much as people think. Well, you know, I think you walk off the mat and there's things that you, you know, you've heard and you said and people say, you know, I should have won that match. You know, I don't think I ever walked off the match and said I should have won it. You know, I walked off the mat and I kind of explained a little bit why didn't I win? Yeah. Right? And and I always had the answers to why. And so you, you, immediately you move forward from it. You follow me? Yeah, totally. I mean, and yeah. why was always back on me. Not because uh, I didn't. I had a coach that didn't show up to practices, or I had partner. My partners wasn't. Cons it was never any of that. That's that's BS. That's bullshit. You know, it always was. Listen, you didn't. You didn't stay focused for long enough. You you know you you let your you let yourself you know slip away with your diet. You cut too much weight coming into this event. You did you know there was always I could answer it. So I think Alan was probably more right that. There wasn't a level of anger. There was a level of thought, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, don't, you know, don't sit here and, and, and lie to yourself, you know. There's a reason why. And, and I think the, the good thing is is that you think you're supposed to win every single match, right? Mm -hmm. And realistically, that's not realistic. You know, but there's nothing wrong with asking why didn't you win this match because you actually believe that you're better than the guy. You know? Yeah. And and for that reason, you know, he's he's probably right, you know. Yeah, mad for a second, you know, but but mad the next day, uh uh. Yeah. Motivated the next day. Excited about what I need to do, where I need to go. Uh, if you figured out some things, I, I'm better because of this loss. You know, and all of a sudden, there's a level of excitement that comes from all that. You know, um, from disappointments, defeats, and and um, yeah, but but mad maybe for a short period of time, not very. I mean, and when I say short period of time, I'm talking about that day. Yeah. Because the next day, it wasn't about feeling mad, angry, pissed off. You know, it was like you can get beat again. You know. Yeah. You know, you better start answering your whys, you know, and, and they need to be honest and it needs to come back on you and not point the finger at something that, that, you know, I always took responsibility. I never, never once did I lose a match because of a coach, because of a workout partner, because of I didn't have workout partners. There was times I didn't have workout partners, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't make, it, didn't make it a reason why I was going to get beat. You know, um, do more stance in motion. Give you give yourself another reason to, to keep winning. You know, um, so that I think that was that was the key for me to be able to bounce back quickly. Yeah. Is just properly answering the questions after you got beat, and not giving yourself a lot of reasons to look at anything. But I'm going to get better. Two more topics in your career. Talking on the same thread. 91, 92, you become a coach. And I've heard you say it's one of the most miserable experiences of your life. You were 50% wrestling, 50% training, short ending both of them. The trials come around, you lose your first match. First time doing America in a long time. What was your why after match one at Fisher? 91? 92. 92. Well, going back to 91, might have been my best tournament I ever wrestled. Oh, wow. So I went from probably wrestling my best that I've ever wrestled in my life at the very peak of my career, you know. Um, 90 was Tokyo, right? 91 was Varna? Mm hmm Yeah, in Tokyo, well, yeah. In Tokyo, you know, in that short span of my career, whether it was 90 or 91, I really hit a, hit a level, a peak in my career that, um, 
I mean, I, I think I teched everyone in the, in the world championships that year, you know, and I was just devastating on top. And I knew it was. I knew if I could take someone down, I could tech anyone. It didn't matter if they were world champion or what. I had that much focus on top and, and had developed so many levels of skills that um, was a lot of confidence. Two, here we are. I took advantage again. I'm glad I did it, but taking on those responsibilities as a coach took away from what made me who I was. All of a sudden, I changed my routine. Um, I was arrogant enough to believe I could do it again, you know. Um, but it needed to be done. I have no regrets. Um, I'm just glad that, um, I'm glad it all worked out, yeah, I mean. So would you train, so let's say practice at three to five, right? So you and Kenny are the co-head coaches. I get the sense that you were running the show, really. And that Chesbro is helping as well, but bottom line, you gotta practice at three to five for the college guys. Was that your workout too, or did you get a second work? Like, what I, got, was your I got a workout, Some, sometimes I worked out with him, but a lot of times it was be, it'd be away from them um, with someone. Um, yeah, it was, it was, um, I was in the middle of that and, and I agreed to it and I was in the middle of it and I'm going, why did you do this? You know, what were you thinking? You know, all of a sudden you don't have, um, you're dealing with 40 athletes, making sure they're making their grades. You're doing some things that, that you never had to, you know, worry about, you know, and, and you think, you know, um, a lot of that, during a lot of those years, you're so self-centered on yourself. You know, all of a sudden you're giving some of your time up. You know, you're helping some guys get better. You know, you're, you're helping some people through some issues academically or whatever. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't ready to do all that, you know. And it, it, um, it kind of threw me for a loop and I knew I was in trouble. Um, but I also knew I made a commitment, you know. And so I stuck with it, didn't walk away from it, um, um, walked them through it. Uh, my long-term goal was to be able to be able to coach and wanted to go into coaching. Um, and, um, you know, there was never a time I didn't, I thought about it. And I knew I was in trouble. I knew I'd made some mistakes. I got sick that year too. Hmm. Um, uh, I had some, I had some sickness that uh, set me back and um, it wasn't a good feeling man it just it was a matter of just fighting every day to get up and just get what I needed to get in you know and even though my workouts my personal workouts wasn't real good and and um, we we're trying to move the team forward um, you know it's just you made this commitment let's go forward with it you know and and even though it's not perfect right now we still have a lot of time after March to refocus on yourself and to get yourself ready. Hmm. As you were saying that, this is kind of an odd thing to say, but do you think becoming a coach made you a better husband? Because yeah. I'm like, I feel like I'm in the position where I, all I care about is myself in this, but I mean, you being a coach, being selfless, that had to help you in your relationships. No, there's no question. It makes you better be a better husband, a better uh, a better father to your children. I mean, my goodness, every day you're dealing with, with children, you know, so, and some of them are children, even when they're 18, <laughs> you know, um, and even when there's some of them are 22, mm -hmm. they're still children, you know, and there's some are men, few of them are men, you know. Um, yeah, it completes a lot of things for you. You know, if you just, you know, you get, you get a lot of experience with a lot of people at that age and, um, they can't bullshit you anymore, right? I mean, right. those days are over. You know, uh, yeah. you've heard you've heard everything. You know? <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah, it uh, definitely makes you a better husband, and but more importantly, as well, it makes you a better father mm. you know, to your children. And so that's kind of the silver lining. But at the time you're in this, you're thinking, you know, I don't know if it's like January. You're starting to realize it's not like things are not going well. Yeah. Um, but like you said, 91 nationals is in March. And then you go to the trials. Um, going into the trials, Rich Bender was telling me a story about you guys went to a candy factory that day. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember this or not, yeah. but Hershey. 
I just thought it was odd that you would be going on a tour before an event like that. At where, the trials? Yeah, no, yeah, the trials. Yeah. Well, actually, he's, he's mistaken. We didn't go on a tour in the trials. Uh, we went on a tour during um, an event that was in Pittsburgh. Maybe it was the Grants. It, it was the Grand event. Got it. Yeah, it wasn't the trials. Because I'm like, yeah. why would he go to a candy no, factory? No, that wasn't true. We, we went to Hershey, Hershey Park or somewhere like that, at Hershey, Hershey factory. Um, before, uh, actually, before we wrestled, uh, before I wrestled Bella Glazov. Oh wow! Yeah, and we all went. He went. Bella Glazov went. And I thought, well, if we all go, then I'll go. Okay. You know, but that wasn't before the trials. You know, I, I, I'm going into trials. I think that's the the struggles I had that year was that I was still sick. I had a I had an infection that lasted um, for about three months, really weakened me. Um, I've told this story a few times, not many, but um, that's what really set me back, more so than anything. I think, uh, you know, you, 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 you do some things during your career and you stay pretty close to, you know, um, you, you have to make changes. I, I don't know how I want to put this, but you have to make changes in your career if you're going to improve. There's no question. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you need to stay pretty close to a routine, right? And be willing to make changes. Making changes, you know, in your training, maybe in your workout. You know, I mean, early on in my career, I ran a lot of stadiums. You know, a lot of stadiums. Late in my career, I didn't, you know. Um, and the reason is, is I wanted to, I wanted to focus on my motion more. And, and I didn't want my legs being tired from these stadiums and going into practice. And I feel fill in those stadiums in practice. Uh, I wanted my legs fresh for every practice later in my career. So you do make those subtle changes, but you want to stick real close to a routine. Well, that year, there was no routine. And so I, I, I had a hard time letting that go. Like, why did you do this to yourself? Why did you? Do, I, I, it's just like, come on, John. You're a five-time world champion. You can list, let this go. Let it go, you know, and move on. I couldn't let it go. I couldn't, I, I, in my head, it was just like, you know, I had plenty of time to, to, to work out too, you know, but I, I was struggling with myself that why did you do this? Why were you, why did you give this much time to something you know that um, is going to, could wreck you here at the end of your career, you know, and so I fought with myself a lot, you know, in that, that year trying to find myself, you know, and, um, and in the end, you know, it, it was a tough ending, you know, but a good ending. It was tough, though. Everything and some, sometimes it's my most rewarding ending. I would say, you know, if I had to look at one particular time in your career that, that, um, that you cherish, it would be that year. And the reason I think it's the adversity, the challenges, um, it's what we have to deal with, you know, all the time, you know, in real life. So it didn't, it wasn't a smooth year like 1990 where you're just blazing through everything and everyone and you feel like King Kong, mm -hmm. you know, this is a year, you, you know, you, you, you never felt like that and, and you, you, you're miserable and you're questioning yourself and you're, um, you're beating yourself up um, and, you know, uh, but yet you're still trying to find a way to win. Yeah. Yeah. And you battled at the, every, the first two matches at the Olympics came down to the last 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. Super close scrambles. Um, it's just, a, like you said, a battle. There's an, and even the look on your face, it's more work at that point versus yeah. getting excited out there. Yeah. And it well, was, you know, I told um, Coach Burnett, he was, he was there. Um, I think I told him, you know, it's just, we were talking before the, the tournament and I said, it's not going to be pretty, but I'm going to win. And so I went in knowing what to expect. And by knowing that, you know, um, just kind of set my mind like, you know, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to prepare to win, maybe, 
matches in the last 30 seconds. You know, you're going to have to prepare to win by one. Are you ready to win by one? Hmm. You know, um, and so for me, I was ready to win by one. I knew that's the kind of tournament I was going to have to have. Mm -hmm. And so when you when you're ready when you're getting ready for that, at least I was honest to myself, right? Yeah. You know, hey, you're going to be wrestling some of these same guys you just beat the living hell out of, you know, a year ago. You know, and um, you know, I mean, kind of, and you're going to have to realize that um, that's not going to happen right now. You don't feel it, you know, and um, you're going to have to find ways to just win matches. Yeah. Yeah. And then after, during that, are you thinking at all if you're going to take the Oklahoma State job? No. Did you have any doubt you would take it? No. I mean, if it was offered, I was ta I'd take it. Yeah. But they didn't, it wasn't like that was on your mind at all during that time? No. Got it. No. I mean, no, I had, en I had enough. Man. You know, there was, yeah, I didn't care. I could care less if I got, you know, I was there to, you know, I think it was just really a... a you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're not wrestling for the joy of something. And that, that was a little bit of, as well my last year. So I'm not wrestling for the joy of winning a, an Olympic gold medal. I'm wrestling to end my career on top. I could care less about the medal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't go f five years and win, and then your last year, you're not win. That's all I could think about. Well, you could do that, and everything's going to be okay. Right, but but in my mind it was just like that's impossible. I can't, I can't, and that's really what pushed me over the edge. It was, it was, it wasn't the gold medal. It was just I don't want to live the next thirty years of my life thinking about this year I didn't win. You know, I mean, wrestlers are like the worst about, you know, most of most of us. I mean, most of your your wrestlers, their careers don't end the way they want. You know, mm -hmm. and they walk away and, and you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of them have regrets, you know. Um, and I think, you know, I had put enough time in up to that point that I'm going, I don't want to be one of those. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I would, I, that's what's going to happen to me, you know, is I can't enjoy being a five-time world champion. <laughs> All I'm going to think about is, you know, and so uh, it's sad. You know, it was kind of, you know, sad that you had to think that way, but um, I don't know. It willed me to win. It willed me to the victory. There's no question. Man. Yeah. And one of my theories of, is that greatness and crazy are next door cousins and they borrow each yeah. other's sugar, right? Yeah. So to be great, you got to be right on you the edge. Be, yeah. And what you're talking about, people are hearing you say, this guy's a five time world champ, and if he didn't win six, he'd be miserable. Well, that's true. And, yeah, I mean, but it sounds crazy. Yeah, you know, but that's you got to be so extreme. Yeah. Well, and and you just don't want to, you know. I mean, there's nothing wrong with ending your career. I mean, at, at 55 years old today, I mean, my views are a lot different than at 26. Mm -hmm. You know that that's not really healthy, John. You know, somewhere along the road, you know, I yeah. mean, you know, but um, I wish I had to deal with some of those guys. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, and kind of rope them in the right direction, you know. Uh, but, um, yeah, I just, I just, uh, and, but, but I, but I, what I said earlier is, uh, it was probably my most valuable season of experience as you, as you move on to become a father and a, and a husband and a coach. Um, the, I learned more in that, that one year than I did in the five previous. Wow. And the reason I say that is because of the emotions and the anxiety, um, because of the challenge of coaching. Always, you know, you always assume, you know, I came off my one of my very best years, and, you, and again, here I am getting overconfident that I actually believe I can do this, you know? And it just, it all that experience kind of in that the last year kind of you know, help me become a, a, a better, really a better coach, father, right. um, husband, you know, that um, there's adversities that are out there. They're just one, one inch away from happening for uh, against you that you're going to have to deal with. And, um, 
I don't know. I mean, that may be I may be overstretching that a little bit, but it just really felt like my most rewarding year when I walked away from wrestling was that last year. Yeah. I mean, I was glad, dude. You were tough. You were tough. You know, you did some things that I didn't know you could do. You know, kind of sound like I was a little bit, a little bit loopy at times upstairs. You know, um, but. But in the end, I was just, I was just, I recognized that uh, even through the loss, you know, um, in the Olympics, um, that it was good to experience what I got to experience. Yeah. And not even two weeks after that, you're a young man, 26, you become the head coach. Now, this is a big turning point, obviously, because then two months later, the NCAA sanctions came out, and to me it's like you guys got penalized twice. But before we get to that, Pat Smith is on his run. And his tough season, like his 92 is like 91 against Tom Ryan. He had a really t- tough time that year. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's just shift to Pat. Where does his accomplishment of winning four national titles rank in terms of all-time collegiate achievements? Number one. You know, he opened the door for a lot of guys to be able to do it, right? You know, I mean, there's, so there's has to be a first somewhere, you know. And anytime you you um, you know thinking about me winning two Olympic gold medals, you know, um, you know, I had I got somebody here, at my own school that done that. You know, I wasn't going to be the first. You know, Yojo Yutaki. I mean, it was just like I got a guy that wrestled here that did that. You know, I I'm not. Why, why are you laughing? I forgot about that. Yeah, I mean, it was I like I forgot that Utaki had won that. Yeah, I, I mean, I got I, I I can't do anything that somebody hadn't done. You know, um, now I you know when in six there, that was something that nobody had done in America, but and and I felt it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I was a little bit of a wreck at the end. You yeah. know, doing something that nobody. I don't think anybody had won five at that time. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, Doing anything for the first time in in a in a sport. I mean, um, let me tell you something. Um, it's it's tough, you know. And um, he had a tough he had a tough experience in his last month of of winning that last one. I mean, yeah. I mean, it was it was a challenge for him, you know. And there's some stories behind all that, you know. And and he and he really in that process of trying to win four, he built another guy up, you know, and, and Mark Branch, um, you know, to a level of confidence that he went in and as a losing record won the national championship that year, you know, um, that helped us win the NCAA yeah. title, right? Yeah. Um, but that that all was him with Pat, you know, experience of trying to win this four and. and and having some bad practices and Mark kicking the tar out of him at times as a freshman late in that year, you know, it built Mark up, you know, and here you got Mark being built up and Pat's confidence going down. And we're like, uh Oh, some of it's good. Some of it's bad, but, um, uh, it, it all ended up being a real positive at the end that, that, that Pat, um, strengthened himself up, went out, performed and, and of course won his fourth, but, you know, anytime anybody does something for the first time, you know, it's, it's, you know, their experience is hard, especially when, when you're talking about doing something for the first time in the nation that no other athlete has ever done this. And you're getting attention beyond your normal attention, you know, and, and definitely Pat Smith was getting, you know, more calls, more, I mean, it was, it was a, a challenging year to keep it all in, all in control and keeping him in a good place. So Mark Branch at the end there was starting to get beat. He's Pat. beating Pat. Did you notice it at first? Like what the oh, heck? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. How'd you manage it? Well, you know, it just, you don't, you don't, you didn't want to change a lot of things, you know, during the, during the end and, and you start compromising for the way he was feeling and the pressure maybe that Pat felt. And, and so, you know, um, they'd go some some live matches, wrestle a couple live matches, and I think Mark beat him a couple times. You know, for sure once. You know, and I, and I remember Pat taking off, running out the door, and and was real emotional about it, and just you know, um, 
And I remember just kind of calming him down and going, listen, um, you're going to be fine, you know. And I think that experience for me in 92 helped me just reassure him that, listen, um, this is going to be fine, you know. Um, I think I said to him one time, hey, if you're going to pout about it, just remember, you don't have to win. And then he got all pissy and started cussing at me. He <laughs> <laughs> was like, hey, hey yeah. you can choke and not win, you know, something like that, you know, and, and you know, we're all going to love you. Right. He was like, that wasn't going to work with him. <laughs> and so it was like, I kind of equate it to the four-minute mile. Before it happened, people maybe didn't think it could be done. Like, same with the Pats four national titles. Every kid who goes to college says they want to be a four-time national champ. Mm -hmm. And to actually do it is just a tremendous amount of pressure. But then if you layer in all the other obstacles Pat hit, it's like, you know, going into his senior year, 92-93, he was dead set on winning the fourth in 93 and being done. Then he asked a redshirt. How did the redshirt impact him? Mm, you know, he would have he ran through it a lot easier in 93. Mm. Yeah, he was on that row and, and just stopping his stopping him at that time. Um, he wanted he wanted to stay, you know. Thank goodness he had a red shirt, you know, for so he could stay and finish it out. You know, we didn't get the we didn't get to wrestle the championships in '93. Mm -hmm. um, we were on probation, and um, he didn't go backwards. You know, he was too. Too determined to move forward, and of course he had plans and hopes afterwards. But um, if he would have wrestled that season in '93, he would have ran right through it. I think he was probably better. I think just maybe holding it up and 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 having um, having to wait another year of this fourth opportunity did, probably didn't help him any. You mm -hmm. know, other than you know, I, I don't think it did. I think it just added some more longevity pressure to him that um, he had to take if he was going to stay. Yeah. And he took it. It just seems like the total opposite experience of your red shirt where you were thriving, loving it, just in another world, whereas he was like coming to a screeching halt and now all this pressure just layers on for another year. Another year. You know. Yeah, it was, it was tough on him. How publicized, I'm just going to flip this mic over. How publicized was the chase for four that last year? Like how often? It was unbelievable, man. I mean, it was just something every week. Every week, I remember helping him control. I mean, controlling. It was a good thing was I was done, right? And so, you know, I, I got to experience a lot, too, along that way and learn some things about, you know, coaching, you know. Um, but, you know, early on, you know, he's – he he – took on a lot of stuff and it seemed like it never affected him, you know, and then towards the end and, and we did probably 10 times more than we ever did. He ever did. I mean, that, that's how much, that's how much interest there was in, in him becoming the first four timer. I mean, 10 times more what? Perhaps. 10 times more media. Oh my goodness. It was constant, you know? Um, I mean, it was just constant request, you know, and, and articles and, um, you know, if you had a, if you had a average match or something, you know, it seemed like there'd be more requests, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, the last month was tough for him. Yeah, as it as it drew closer, it was a little bit tougher and a little bit more emotional. You know, um, I don't think he was enjoying it as much. You know, um, I think it became a, um, a scenario. That this is what I have to do. You know, and that's the worst scenarios, you know, kind of, you know, I have to do this. Um, when it when it's when it gets away from, you know, the attitude, I want to do this, I'm going to, you know, when you get anytime you get away from that attitude, you know, all of a sudden it's not enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Right. And so for the most part, you know, and even in my career, you know, I got to enjoy I want to do this for five of my six. Mm -hmm. In the end, I had to do it. Right. right. And I think he felt the same. And I think we all have to. I mean, eventually, you, you, that's where you go if you let pressure enter in, right? And, yeah. And if you don't go there, you ain't winning. <laughs> right? Absolutely. You ain't winning. Because you've got to find a will that's beyond 
you know, anything else. And and he and he willed himself to the championship. There ain't any question. Um, he, yeah, he willed himself through practices he, and, and struggles and and um, um, you know, tough kid. That's what everyone says about tough. They go, I go. How would you just how would you describe Pat? They go tough, and then they spell it like how you guys say it with an accent. Yeah. Cardell Moore commented on there. He's like, it's T U F. <laughs> yeah. Tough. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the thing about Pat was. Um, he wasn't gifted with some of the, the uh, flexibility, some of the speed, you know, some, some things I just had naturally, you know, um, you know, you know, my flexibility saved me through a lot of injuries, you know, um, with Pat, I keep looking at this picture over here. That's why I'm staring over there. It's Pat winning number yeah. four. Um, he wasn't gifted with raw talent. I mean, he earned everything, you know, and, and for him to win, um, you know, he couldn't, he had to stay ahead in the score. He had to do the right things, you know, um, and, and focus on, you know, strategies of how to wrestle certain opponents without maybe that some of the, the the skill level that 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 you need to beat them every time but um i don't know if that makes sense but no it does yeah um you know him winning four uh, he's far from my most talented wrestler i mean far from it not even top five mm, maybe not probably not wow he had a real will man i mean he was he was he had a will to win you know and um he wasn't, you know, if you go back and watch his matches, I mean, he just had great intensity. He was coming at you. He'd wrestle you hard, he'd, you know, but it wasn't with a lot of speed, pop, snap, you know, um, you know, uh, quickness. You wouldn't call him a quick wrestler. You'd call him a, more of a technical wrestler. Mm -hmm. um, and and I've seen him in the middle of a lot of matches where, um, you know, my score might be five to three, and he'd just will it. And, and just bang it out to, to end up a 12 to five match, you know, separate the score in some way. That's what, that's what, that's why I say he was absolutely the toughest wrestler I ever coached. Wow. Because in these tough moments, in these tough moments, you knew that it wasn't going to be his talent that won, you know, it was going to be his will, mm -hmm. you know, Maybe with me, you know, the difference is, is speed, you know, my talent was going to show up in this moment, you know, and boom, 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 five laces, you know, later, and <laughs> you're up by 10, right? right. Or, you know, for Pat, it was just pure toughness. It was just will, he willed himself to, to major decisions to um, separate the score and to make sure he didn't get beat, you know, um, tough, tough, tough. And going into that 94 tournament, you had the team title on the line. You also have your brother. How are you balancing the motions of chasing and winning the team title versus helping Pat get through it? Well, you know, it was way more important for Pat to win. You know, I mean, for Oklahoma State, to me, it was just, to me, it was, you know, <clears throat> and it was easy. It was easy. Let's surround around Pat. Pat wins this thing. He's going to pull all you guys for it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know. So you know, you just imagine for a program that's won several national championships already. Here it is. We get to have another first for it. You know, yeah. the first wrestler ever win four NCAA championships came from Oklahoma State. You know, that's a it's a big honor. You Huge. know, you want that. Yeah. You know, and so I knew by by reinforcing that with the team not so much when with pat around but reinforce it follow follow him mm -hmm. he's going to take you where you guys want to go and at the time i didn't know but i had a good feeling that that he was going to will himself to the championships and um and i think it, it moved everybody up you know we did some things in that tournament that that uh 
we hadn't done all year, and that's perform over our head and with some of those guys, and that's what happened. And, and there was no question that uh, we all, we all as a team, benefited from Pat winning four f to help our team win the championship. Yeah. No question. Plus, Alan Freed was on fire that yeah, weekend. he was tough. God, he was Martin on fire. Branch, Perlers. Yeah. Um, man. Uh, the three champs that year. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know that Pat's last match at Gallagher that year was senior night against Iowa, and it was Joe Williams' first college match? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he tagged him. Yeah. And, you know, I think if you go back and look at that match, there was nothing easy about that tech. Oh, I haven't seen it. Yeah. Um, you you kind of – I remember watching that match, and I remember, I remember – thinking, my goodness, that guy's going to be good. I remember that. And, and you kind of you kind of saw, I saw Pat really struggling out there to score points, and there was a fight there from Joe Williams that, you know, okay, this kid's going to be good. Mm -hmm. And little did we know, you know, uh, he ended up being a great, great wrestler for Iowa as well as for the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. He's a Chicago guy, so he was legendary growing up. Him and his brothers, they won like 10 state titles. Yeah. Um, and TJ actually has the best winning percentage ever in Iowa, 98-1. Anyway, um, I just thought it was so unique because Pat's first match, he got beat by a four-timer. Joe Dan, Russell. Dan Russell. Oh, Dan Russell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you, uh, were you at that one? I was at it. You know, and I didn't, I didn't know anything about Dan at the time. I, I pulled him off. Um, Coach C uh, pulled Joe, uh, Pat out of red shirt and... Um, I think we were wrestling in Portland, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were wrestling in Portland, which, you know, seems so many years ago. Um, and I was so mad at him, the way he wrestled. I mean, not really giving any respect to Dan at the time. Like, Dan, you're pretty tough. I mean, well, you know, you can do this to a true freshman. You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't visualize it like that, but I pulled him over the side, and I, you know, was – and he was bald like a baby. I remember like he just, just, you know, ended up getting, I don't know, what was the score? Pinned. Pinned, yeah. He got pinned. I, I didn't want to say that. I was kind of, yeah, he ended up getting pinned. And then um, it's the way he got pinned. It was like he got beat up and then he got pinned. And so I, I remember pulling him over to the side, and I'm screaming and yelling, "Why are you, put, you know, Joe C pulls you out of red shirt, and you're pulling this, this, this?" And uh, uh, you know that that happened in, I want to say in December, late December, mm -hmm. maybe after Christmas. Yeah. Um, January, February, you know, two and a half months later, major major decision. Uh, Dan Russell in the semifinals. Right. Yeah, and not only did he get pinned that day, but he got beat up too by Joe Russell, or Dan Russell. And then, and he just, you know, there was a level of acceptance that he took. Uh, he was embarrassed. There was a level of acceptance that he took, and and um, that you just want to see out of athletes, right? Hmm. You know, they didn't. They didn't come back and ask why, you know, they knew why, you know, and, and, and it was really, really neat to see him mature through that year t to go from getting beat up in the score and pinned to winning by a major decision two and a half months later. And the crazy thing is just like when you and Gil wrestled, you wrestled like the next day at the Nebraska Open, they wrestled the next day at the Portland State Open, Dan still beat him, but it was like two points. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's like, all right, Dan's legit. Yeah. You know, he's a four-time D2 yeah, champ. Yeah, no, he's good. Um, and yeah, he could have, yeah. He's real good. Well, and, and, he, and he wrestled Pat in the semifinals. You wonder what the craziest thing is? In that, that year in the yes. in the championship. But know? for him to get to the semis, he beat McAllister, who Pat yeah. beat out. What? Just the connection. There was, OSU had three All-Americans at that weight that year. Because McAllister went to Cal State Bakersfield. Yeah. Another dude went to Fresno State. Yeah. Can't remember his name. And then Pat. All those dudes were in the room. So were you surprised Pat's redshirt was pulled? No. Yes and no. You know, I think Joe at the time was getting a little heat, unnecessary heat that he that he didn't deserve. And 
um, it really wasn't fair. But but um, I think people were wanted him wanted him out, you know, wanted him to come out uh, because we he had they thought they had a chance of winning, which I was like, well, you can pull him out, but you're not going to win, you know. Let's pull him out to to prepare for teams in the future, and he'll gain some experience and, and he'll learn some things and he'll be a little bit pre more prepared for the next year. You know, let's. I don't mind you doing that, but yeah. but you know, just for if you think you're going to win, I don't know. The the you know the the dominance doesn't look like it's there. You know, so yeah. But I think there was a little pressure to pull him out and have a little better season than maybe what they thought they were going to have. Here's the we're almost done here, but here's the uh, here's uh, Joe talking about this. He actually lives in the country of Jordan now. Um, Who? Joe Joe Russell. Wait, I'm saying it wrong now. Dan, Dan Russell. Dan Russell. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he actually lives in Jordan, um, the country right now, and it, like his whole thing is trying to get wrestling in Jordan. But here's Dan talking about the ninety. I think by the time we got to the NCAA's, uh, that was extremely well coached in, in the, the strategy. The score that our match that we had in, at the NCAA's was, uh, it, it, it was not a great score on my end, but the score did not reflect uh, how bad he beat me in that match. Uh, it, it, uh, his strategy, the, the, his tactic, he wrestled a perfect match. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, when Pat went to the NCAAs, uh, he wrestled it like he wrestled any other tournament. And, and Pat was one that didn't, didn't want to lose. And uh, he was well prepared. I think he was well coached. And uh, I, he just went out and wrestled. Yeah. That's nice for Dan to say that, you know. I think the thing that, that – with, with what he said was, um, you know, how tough he felt, you know. That was tough. Yeah. I mean, he learned he learned a lot through that experience, you know, and um, you can take it one way or the other, right? I think I was probably way too hard on him. Actually, I know I was when he got beat, you know, got beat up and then pinned. Um I mean, I was I was devastated, you know. It, you know, it's like, who are you? You know, I mean, um, I guess what I want to say is is this: at that moment in time in Pat's career, I said probably things that should have never been said to a student athlete. He was my brother. I'm, you know, uh, you know, this is 1992. Or yeah, 92, right? Is it 90? Or 90, 90. Yeah. 1990, yeah. This is his career, I'm thinking 92. Yeah. Um, and so I'm in, the, I'm in the midst of my running for championships, and I'm, t I, you know, I'm like, we don't lose, you know, whatever. And, and he takes what I said, and he goes and does it. Doesn't complain. You know, um, you know, doesn't doesn't resent me for what I said and, and what I did, and he just that tough. Yeah. Like you're right. <laughs> you know, he's just like you're right. You know, um, that's Pat Smith, right? Not, tough, ninety ninety nine out of a hundred though might have not re reacted that way. Well, yeah, I mean, I I, I you know I, I probably. You know, I hadn't even come close to anything like that. You know, you can't do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. You know, um, uh, uh, you know, it's just tough guy that that you know, just like you know, you're right. Right. You know, at, at 18 years old, you know, um, just a baby. You know, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, and he's um, he's also following me. Yeah. Right. I mean. I mean, how did he look at that? You know, he obviously never looked at my what I did as a, something that was going to be detrimental to his career. He always looked at it as, 
you know, something positive, like this is going to help me do what I want to do. Pressure's a privilege. Yeah, pressure's, you a, pressure's a privilege. You right? Know, and, That's your saying? Yeah. yeah. I love that. And this is probably my favorite finals match ever, and then we're done. Okay. Tom Ryan, I've interviewed Tom Ryan. He talks a lot about this match, as does Gable. 30 seconds left in this yeah. match. What is John C. telling Pat Smith? Stay low, stay focused, and once again, you go back to your basics, your bread and butter, and that is that Smith low single. You always want to have an option, but when it gets down to crunch time, you want to go back to what works best for you, and Smith is in on that low single. He's got Ryan down. That should be a takedown right there. That should put him up seven. What is Joe C. telling Pat Smith? Stay low, stay focused, and once again, you go back to your basics, your bread and butter, and that is that Smith low single. You always want to have an option, but when it gets down to crunch time, you want to go back to what works best for you, and Smith is in on that low single. He's got Ryan down. That should be a takedown. Good low single. That should put him up seven. Is it a misdirection? A little bit? A little bit. A little tiny bit, right? They, keep, they stop it right there. That's just, Is that the... I stop it. You, yeah. you, it's on YouTube, the full match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he rides him out, though. Yeah. Um, but it's like, that's tough right there. In Carver, you know, in like Iowa, steamrolled. 91. Yeah, he's steamrolled. Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, brands and free battle, and then you go in the finals with your brother here, and it's like, and Tom Ryan's a tough competitor. Yeah. Right? And, yeah, and... Um, yeah, I mean, you just you just kind of look at the moments in Pat's career to win four, and and there's matches before that, you know, some semifinal matches, but you just there was nothing really easy. wasn't wasn't like Pat went out and you know he beat people, you know, thirteen to two, and you know, and and separated the scores, and you know, he's battling, he's yeah. battling to win matches, he's. Yeah, he's wrestling guys in the semis that had beaten him before, you know. Um, and I think for that reason, that's why you need to really appreciate Pat Smith is just how tough he was at the most challenging moments to win four championships because that's what he's going to be known for, right? And, and, and in some ways, those four championships, I don't know, they're, they're probably as tough as winning six world championships. That's it for this episode of Wrestling Changed My Life. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. As always, thank you to our sponsor, Spartan Combat. They're hosting a national tournament in Jacksonville, Florida, May 20th through the 23rd. You can register now at spartancombat.com. To watch the video interview of this episode, go to Wrestling Changed My Life on YouTube, you can also see the clips on Instagram and Twitter at Wrestling Changed My Life. That's it, folks. We'll see you next time.